Uh, Nick Goddard has our children's story. Well, good morning, boys and girls. How is everyone today? Is everyone enjoying the cool weather? Yeah, it's fun to go outside and play in the snow, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, this time of the year is when everybody thinks about um, the Christmas and all of the things that go on with that. And so my mind got thinking about, you know, what is important about this time of year to some of the older? What's important? We celebrate Jesus' birthday. Celebrate Jesus' birthday. That is correct. And that is the most important part. But what else do we get this time of the year? Presents. We get presents, don't we? Yeah. And in the Bible, it tells us that the, uh, the King Herod had sent some special presents to with the wise men when they went out to find the baby Jesus. And that's where I'd like to go this morning is on presents and how special they are. When I was a young boy, and I was a little bit older than you guys, when my family decided that we weren't going to have any more Christmas, no more birthdays, no more presents, and it was, oh no, what are we going to do? We'll be different. But I found that we weren't any different. We were just normal, and it was a different way of living, that's for sure. But presents are something that is given to you because people love you. But I've noticed that over the time that sometimes when we get presents, some of them are big boxes, some of them are small boxes. And sometimes we want the bigger box because we think it's got a more special present in it than the smaller box. But that isn't normally the case. It is who is giving you that present is the most important part of that. And God says that we have to be cheerful givers and that we need to love everyone. And you know, love comes in big packages. Love comes in small packages. You know, the bigger packages are like the older ones in our church who have raised their children and have watched everybody grow and they love us so much. Amen. And they give us lots of joy. And the little packages are those new little babies that come into our church. And soon they grow up to be your size and your size and, your, and even my size. And we all have lots of good gifts to give. The Bible says that where there is a happy heart, Jesus is living in our heart. Amen. And when we're sad, doesn't mean that he's went away, but it means that we need to find him a little closer. So I just wanted to let you know that this time of the year, we need to have happy hearts no matter what size our gifts are. And as parents, we need to be able to explain that all gifts come from God. Amen. And Jesus said, or God said, his son Jesus, as you've already said, into this world to be like you and me. He started out small and he learned. He obeyed God. And eventually he went back to God. And that's what our life is going to be too. So today, as we celebrate this time of the year, and when your little brother gets a bigger package than yours, doesn't mean it's any more special. And when we get socks instead of toys, doesn't mean that that person that gives us socks doesn't love us any more than that person who gives us toys. They all love each and every one because you're very special. And God has sent his son because he thinks you are so special. He sent his son to live in our hearts so that we can live with God forever. Cheryl Thompson from Davenport has our special music. <laughs> I post not 
God of works, nor tell of good deeds, for not have I done to merit his grace, all glory and praise shall rest upon him, so willing to die in my place. Happy Sabbath, Muscatine. <laughs> How many of you are delighted, excited, and just so appreciative of what Jesus did on the cross? Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, babes. That's my pet name. <laughs> but you know, at the very outset, I should just like to express my gratitude and thanks initially to Pastor, our wonderful pastor, Pastor Cabrera, and to the leadership and members of the Muscatine Church for allowing me the privilege of sharing Jesus with you today. You know, it's cold outside. 
isn't it? Yeah. But there's sunshine in our souls. <laughs> Praise, the Lord. Praise the Lord. I see at least one familiar face back there <laughs> that I see often at the Davenport Church. And interestingly enough, talking about the cold, I'm just convinced that the Lord is on a mission. <laughs> You see, he's brought us from the Bahamas. That's where we're from originally. <laughs> Moved us on to Florida, where we lived for a few years. <laughs> and now we're here in beautiful Iowa. <laughs> Last week, Sunday, when the snow came, it was the first time that my children had ever seen snow. <laughs> so early in the morning, they woke us up, Dad, it's, it's snowing outside. <laughs> so they went out tumbling and doing their thing. But I'm just so excited about what it is that the Lord will do next. He's always up to some good stuff, isn't he? <laughs> For the next few moments, I should like to speak with you and just to remind you of some things because these are things that I'm absolutely certain that you're already familiar with. So I should just like to speak on the topic, God's fitness plan. God's fitness plan. For a brief moment, if you would be so kind as to bow with me as we pray, I'd be most appreciative. Father in heaven, thank you for your love. It's your time now. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will achieve your purpose through me. And allow us at the end of this exercise to bring glory and honor only to you. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You would have noticed that the scripture reading was taken from 3 John 2. An old familiar text. And let's just repeat it together because we're familiar with it. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. You might ask, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, God's fitness plan, when we talk about fitness, initially, we think about what? I know my son, he's, he's an active basketball fella, and you know, sometimes he laughs at me as I do my jogging on the spot around the house. He says, well, you know. <laughs> but when we think about fitness, we think about initially, about physical fitness, don't we? Do you think God is interested in us physically? Yeah. Absolutely. The Bible is very clear on this point. You see, it says your body, our bodies, is the temple of the Lord. Are we convinced? Yeah. Well, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 tells us what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your bodies. God expects us to glorify him in our bodies. And this is why in the Advent movement, over the years, the old acronym that we're so familiar with, New Start, does that ring a bell? New Start, capital N stands for what? 
Nutrition. We should ensure, as the servant of the Lord says, in councils of diet, on diets and food and the Bible and everything else, we want to eat good foods. We want to be healthy. E. Get, get lots of regular exercise. We're keeping in shape here. W. What do you think W might be? Um, what do you think W might be? Water. Drink lots of water. New. Start. S. S. Sunlight. Well, you know, I don't know how much we'll get today, but, but get some sunlight, sunshine. Those essential essentials of the sunshine. T. T for what? Temperance. Temperance. Everything in moderation. You know the old people when I was growing up in the Bahamas, they had a saying, they said, too much of anything is good for nothing. <laughs> Temperance, everything in moderation. Air, fresh air. R, R is the obvious one. Rest, get lots of rest. Sometimes we do ourselves a disservice by not getting sufficient rest. Anyone guilty? Guilty, that would be me. <laughs> Right? <laughs> but the last T in New Start, which is really the most critical of the lot, the last T would be what? Trust, but not just trusting in anything, but trust how? In God. Trust in God, because it's He who will keep us. Our bodies, the temple of God. God wants to transform and renew both our bodies and our minds. We're talking about what kind of fitness here? Physical fitness. Remember, we're talking about God's fitness plan. Initially, physical fitness. And Romans 12, 1 and 2 makes that very clear. That he wants us to present our bodies a living sacrifice. It goes on to say, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind both in body and mind. And I know I might be going a little bit quickly here, so uh, you may want to just scribble down some of those texts if you, if you, if you think they might be off a bit, <laughs> you know, because we might not have time to turn to all of them. So in God's fitness plan, he wants us to be physically fit. But he also wants us and is desirous of us being financially fit. Is that a surprise? God wants us to be financially fit. In the very same text, which is our scripture, he says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper. Now, when we think about prosperity, and of course, prosperity occurs in many spheres, but initially that which comes to mind is when we think about prosperity, we probably think about being financially fit. Well, that's what I thought about, <laughs> right? Now, how does he want us to be financially fit? He gave us a very clear formula. Malachi 3, 6 to 12, makes the point very clear, it says, faithfulness in tithe and offering comes with a promise. Is that a text that anybody is familiar with, Malachi 3, 6 to 12? Anytime the offering is being done, generally so, that's the text, isn't it? But here's how it begins in verse 6. 
For I am the Lord. And what does it say? I change not. So this hasn't changed at all. I change not. It goes down on in verse 7 to the end says, Return unto me, and I will do what? Return unto you, said the Lord of hosts. But then the question is asked, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but he say, Wherein have I robbed thee? And he says, In what? Tithe and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse. Why? Because ye have robbed me. Bringing all the tithes into the storehouse, and where's the storehouse? Where's God's storehouse? His church. Right? And why should we do so? So that there will be meat. I've often said to people that God's financial plan is a master plan. If we were to follow God's financial plan of systematic benevolence, the church would never have need for anything. Amen. God's house will be so full and running over. We will be asking, what should we do with the resources he has given us? We don't need to have a fundraiser for this, a fundraiser for that. Just revert to God's financial plan of systematic benevolence. And we'll be just all right. I know that these points of fitness each could be a sermon unto itself. So I'm just skim cross <laughs> very quickly, you know. But the promise, he says, and prove me. Prove me herewith, said the Lord of hosts. And what has he promised? What is the very clear promise in verse 10? If I, God, will not open the windows of heaven and do what? Pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. You ever wondered why he said windows and not doors? Well, most homes, most buildings seem to have more windows than doors. And I think much more can get through the windows than through the couple doors. Right? So if the windows of heaven are open and he's pouring out a blessing, so much so that we won't have room enough to receive it. Not only that, he says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. I know in Iowa, in the heartland, we're somewhat of a farming community. Imagine that everybody around their corn and grain and the rest of it is being destroyed, but not yours. He says, I will keep the devourer at bay. I will save you that money that you would otherwise lose. I would keep you healthy rather than giving it to the doctors. I praise the Lord that at least for the last little while since we've been here, nobody has been sick. Praise the Lord. Because I tell you, if one of us got sick, I don't know what would happen. But I will keep away from you those things that might otherwise hurt you. He shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, the devourer. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, said the Lord. What are we talking about here? We're talking about financial fitness. Proverbs 11, 24, and 25 even makes it more clear. Essentially, what it says is that generosity results in prosperity. These are not my words. 
Generosity results in prosperity. Verse 25, the generous man will, did it say might? The generous man will be prosperous and he who waters will himself be watered. That's the Bible now, Proverbs 24 and 25. So we're talking here about God's fitness plan. And we're talking even the more about financial fitness. Praise the Lord. I don't know if you're familiar with that hymn. It says, my father is rich in houses and land. He holded the wealth of the world in his hand. I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the king. With Jesus, my savior. I'm a child of the king. So even in the worst situation, without resources, we can be assured that Jesus, with Jesus our savior, I'm a child of the king, so he'll take care of us. Amen? Amen? Not only does he want us to be physically fit, financially fit, but he also wants us then, in the very same text, the third thing he talks about there is what? He, wants, he, he talks about what? Even as thy soul prospereth. He wants us then to also be spiritually fit. Amen? How do we be fi spiritually fit? Matthew 6 and 33 tells us very clearly. He says, but seek ye when? First, the kingdom of God and whose righteousness? His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Acts 16, 31. How are we going to be spiritually fit? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou might, thou shalt be saved. This is a promise, a very clear promise. Philippians 2 and 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is how we get spiritually fit. You know, there's a preacher with whom I grew up. His name is L.V. Macmillan. You may not be familiar with him, but he was the president of the Bahamas Conference for some years. Later on, he went to serve in the Inter-America Division. But Elder Mac shared with me a very simple formula for spiritual fitness. Another acronym, P-S-R-L. P, prayer, prayer, talk with God often as to a friend, communicate regularly with him, S, surrender, surrender completely to Jesus, R, Read and feed on his word daily, regularly. Read and feed on his word. And L, listen to him as he speaks. God wants to speak to us. Have you ever had a conversation with him? He speaks to us. Well, uh, 
let me speak for myself. Jesus speaks to me. He speaks to us through his word. And sometimes he does directly so. We might be going east. He say, listen, no, 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 no. Not east, west. He wants to guide us accordingly and speak directly to us. If we're going to be spiritually fit, we must be in Christ. In Christ. Did I say anything about just knowing, knowing about Christ? We must know Jesus and be in Christ. 1 John 4 and 15, how do we get in Christ? 1 John 4 and 15 makes it very clear. He says, whoever, no restrictions, this is for anybody. That's how the text begins. It says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, what happens? God abides in him and he in God. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. That's how we get in Christ. So not only does he want us to be physically fit he also wants us to be because we're talking about God's fitness plan here now so what was the first one he wants us to be how physically fit secondly he wants us to be what financially fit it's okay I know we're in a seventh day Adventist church it's okay we can talk about money that's all right right it's the, 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 the Bible says for the love of money it didn't say money was evil it says the love of money is the root of all evil the same Bible says money answer at all things <laughs> right so really I don't know about you but I can tell you for me if I had some money, it probably answers 70% of my prayer. Is that shocking? Well, I can prove it to you. Let's talk after. <laughs> right? But the second was financially fit. So the third point of fitness was what? He wants us to be, and the most important, spiritually. Spiritually fit. But praise the Lord, it doesn't end there. God doesn't just leave it all to us. He fits us up. He then now fits us up for eternity. He wants us to be fit to the point where we have the benefit of life everlasting with him. How does this fitness for eternity work? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 makes it very clear. God gives us his gift of salvation. We are saved. How are we saved? By grace through faith. Verse 8 starts off by saying, and let's just look at it quickly. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Right? And not that and that not of yourselves it is the what gift of God not as a result of works so that no one may boast for we are whose workmanship his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand 
so that we would walk in him. The gift of God saved by grace through faith, and I like to add to that like Luther, through faith alone. I also like to put something else on there. Saved by grace through faith in Jesus the Christ alone. It is he who will save us. He alone. Romans 5, 6 to 11, there's a whole lot of go going on there. But Christ died for us even in our most wretched state. None of us can qualify on our own to be saved. However, it says Christ died for us in verse 6 while we were what? Still helpless. Number one, we were helpless. Now when you're helpless, you really can't do nothing for yourself. Right? But we were helpless. In the same verse 6, it goes on to say that he died for the ungodly. At a time when I wanted absolutely nothing to do with him, he had already died to rescue me. God demonstrates in verse 8 his own love toward us. In that while we were thirdly yet sinners, we were sinners, but Christ died. Still sinners, but Christ died for us. Much more having now been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. While we were enemies of God, Christ died. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more. Praise the Lord, much more. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Praise the Lord. Reconciled to Christ. I happen to have done quite a bit of accounting and financial services over the years. In fact, my first job, my very first job, I started out in financial services as a reconciliation clerk. <laughs> To be reconciled, that means that we're making some effort now to cause the two to look the same. The bank records and the, and the ledger, right? When we're reconciled to Christ, Jesus, then, because he's always drawing and pulling us, right? If we but were to stop resisting, we will be saved. So he pulls us and draws us. And when we connect to him, that connection causes there to be reconciliation. It is he who transforms us. It is he who takes responsibility for our salvation. It is he who changes us. Not me, I don't have the ability to change myself. In fact, well, historically so, at a certain point, I didn't even want to change. But Christ died, Jesus died. And as long as we would but stop, like I've said, resisting, he's drawing. If we were to but not resist, the servant of the Lord even speaks further about that. 
will make that connection. And he will do his thing. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, In Christ, Jesus takes the damnation of our sins and gives us the benefits of his righteousness. The text reads exactly, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. I'm so glad that he, Jesus, considers me and you to be so important. He extends his love, his grace, his mercy. God will work in us for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work his good pleasure. Whose good pleasure? His good pleasure. Philippians 2, 13 and 16. Philippians 1 and 6 even speaks further and says, He, Jesus, God, will finish that which he starts in us. He doesn't leave any unfinished business going on. He doesn't start something and then think about it and leaves it alone. He doesn't just want to save us. He wants to save us completely. And he will finish that. For I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in me will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen? You see, Romans 8, 1 to 3, a wonderful text indeed. It says, therefore, oh, I love this part. Therefore, please turn there with me. Romans 8, 1 to 3. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Don't let nobody tell you about what you've done and where you've been. The question is, are you in Christ Jesus? In Christ Jesus, there is now, therefore, no condemnation. Right? Praise the Lord. We're no longer condemned. Jesus came to save us. John 3, 16 and 17, that old familiar text that we know only too well. Let's just repeat it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And verse 17, which we often don't add to it, but 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Praise the Lord. Jesus. Jesus is still in the saving business. Amen? You see, remember now, we're talking about how God fits us up for eternity. John, 1 John 5, 11 to 13 tells us that in Christ, in Christ, we have eternal life. God has given us eternal life through his son. Now, I know this one gets a little tricky. <laughs> Did it say in Christ 
we are looking forward to having eternal life. Oh, that's not what it says. Let's just read what it says, right? What does the text say? 1 John 5, 11 and 13. I don't, you know, let me let you read it for yourselves, right? And this is the record that God had given to us eternal life, and this life is where? In his son, Jesus. In Jesus, we have eternal life. He that had the Son had life, and he that had not the Son of God had not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that he may know that he have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Praise the Lord. The only question that has to be asked then is, do you have Jesus? Well, in him, we have the benefit of eternal life. This is why it's so important for us to remain always in Christ. In Christ. You see, because of the death of Jesus and his saving grace. I say because of the death of Jesus and his saving grace. Because Jesus' only purpose is to save. That's why God sent him to save. His major, the only thing he's concerned about is saving mankind. Right? Because of his death, praise the Lord, I can say very clearly then, as you can, that I've been justified. How do I know? Romans 5 and 9. I was reconciled with God. How do I know? Romans 5 and 10. God has demonstrated his love toward me. Romans 5 and 8 and John 3 and 16. I was crucified with Christ. Romans 6, 5 to 7. But it doesn't stop there. He became sin. Jesus now became sin for me and died as me. 2 Corinthians 5 and 14. That which I deserved, he took and gave me and you that which he deserved. Romans 6 and 23 is very clear. It says, for the wages of sin is what? Death. Is there anybody here who has sinned? Well, I'm probably in the wrong church. Is there anybody here who has ever sinned? Well, praise the Lord. That's why Jesus came for us sinners. Right? But the pay for sin is death. But instead of giving us death, praise the Lord, the, the text doesn't stop there. It says, but, but, but the gift of God, the gift of God is life eternal. Rather than me getting what I deserved, death, in Christ now, I'm able to have his benefit of life eternal, all paid for in full at Calvary. Thank you, Lord, for Calvary. But because of the death of Jesus and his saving grace, not only has he become sin for me, but I have been released completely from my sins. You have been released completely.
completely from your sins according to Revelation 1 and 5, there is no second death in my future. Jesus has already done it for us. How do I know? Hebrews 2 and 9. If we are in Christ, remember now, this all presupposes that we are in Christ. I have been freed from the fear of death, from slavery to sin, and have even been freed from the devil. Hebrews 2 and 15. Because of the death of Jesus and his saving grace, I'm no longer condemned because my condemnation fell on him. Thank you, Jesus, for fitting me up. Thank you, Jesus, for fitting us up, you see, because we couldn't do it alone. If it were not for him, if that is not love, the old song used to say, if that isn't love, the ocean is dry. Amen. If that isn't love, then there's no cloud in the sky. Praise the Lord. This is true, genuine love. Amen. Jesus, come to save us. He doesn't want any of us to be lost. Amen. He just wants us then to stop resisting. Stop resisting. You know, I often tell the story about the... If, a, if, if someone is out in the ocean drowning, I told you I'm from the Bahamas, so we have a lot of water. We have more water than land, <laughs> right? The lifeguard is on the shore and someone's out there drowning and struggling and fighting. The lifeguard would probably stand on the shore and just watch very carefully. To the untrained eye, the person would be, well, well, why isn't the lifeguard doing something? As soon as the drowning man or woman stops fighting and stops struggling, the lifeguard springs into action. Why? Well, if you try to save a fighting man, not only will you have one death that day, but there'll be two. The lifeguard himself will be pulled under. Jesus wants to save us. Jesus is simply asking us to stop fighting. Stop struggling. Stop resisting. But instead, just surrender. Surrender to him. And allow him to save us. Oh, isn't it just so wonderful and easy? He doesn't want to make salvation complex. It's easy. Just stop struggling, just stop fighting, just surrender. This is salvation by way of giving up. <laughs> right? You see, we're in a society where we believe somehow or the other, obviously we're in an individualistic society, and we believe that whatever is going to be done, I have to have a part in it. Well, with his formula, he says, listen, man, in colloquialism, I got you. <laughs> I have you. I have you covered. Just surrender. Amen. Surrender to him. You know, today, and perhaps if the, uh, on the instruments, if you'd be so kind as to just play briefly in the background, number 314, Just As I Am. I just want to make three very quick appeals. Very quick. I know it's time to go home. <laughs> 
quick, but very quick, and it won't take long, I assure you. The first appeal, really, is to anybody. Is there anybody in this congregation who has never had a relationship with Christ, and you can go right ahead, and wants to find out more? You said, you know, that business of having Jesus save me, I want to find out a little bit more about that because I don't want to take that chance. Is there any such person? Any such person? The second appeal, because you know, I don't want to, this is not to embarrass anybody, but the Lord has directed me to make this appeal, right? If there's anybody who perhaps has walked with the Lord some time ago, but for one reason or the other, or the other whatever that reason is, you've fallen away. You've fallen away. I know, no, I've been there before. So I understand. Is there anybody who fits in that category and simply says now, Quint, you know, what you're saying makes sense. And I need Jesus to fit me up. Because I want to live with him eternally. Anybody. And the third category is simply those of us who are members of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Those of us who perhaps, perhaps you're like me. Who, I'm the only one of my mother's children who was born after she joined the church. A lifelong Seventh-day Adventist. But you've been an Adventist for many years. But you're simply saying, I want a deeper relationship with Christ. Or you may even say like I would. You know, all of these years sitting at the feet of sermon after sermon, preacher after preacher, Sabbath school after Sabbath school. Yes, I know a lot about Jesus. I knew a lot about Jesus. But now, I want to know Jesus. You see, there's a difference between the two. Knowing a lot about Jesus isn't sufficient for our salvation. Knowing Jesus by surrendering to him completely and allowing him to take control of our lives and allowing him to save us, allowing him to fit us up, that's where the rubber meets the road. If there's anybody who fits in any one, two or three of those categories, I just invite you now to please stand. To please stand. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And for those who would want to find out a little bit more in category number one you know afterward you can feel free to slip me a note slip one of the elders a note man we are on a mission we don't want anybody to be lost because Jesus doesn't want us to be lost thank you God for all that you've done Thank you for surrendering completely anew to him.